All right, so now let's say that we have our lighting exactly where we want it, which in this case is maybe not perfect, but uh, our scene is at least lit and we're ready to render. Let's go through what that process is going to be like and specifically for this project and what I want for deliverables. Uh, generally speaking, I want everything rendered 1920 by 1080, so full HD. Uh, and then I want a wide shot and three not really full close-ups, but closer shots that show different kind of aspects of the room that kind of highlight whether it be, you know, a more interesting furniture piece or a little mini scene that you have set up in your room. Because, um, you know, one wide shot is not going to show off everything that you've done. And I want, I want to see what you've done, and I want you to be able to show that off so that you can put it in a portfolio and then somebody can see that, hey, I want to hire you to do that. So that's the goal is to get you all hired and big money jobs, right? So first thing we need in order to uh, render is we need a camera. And I actually have a camera currently in the scene, which I'm controlling. But let's say I want to do a new camera. Uh, we go to create cameras. And remember, we have three options for camera. We have camera, camera and aim, camera, aim and up. So I'll start with just the basic camera. I did go over this uh, last semester briefly, but we can cover it here as well. So uh, adds in the scene, and again, because we're working at larger scale, we need to scale it up a bit. The scale of the actual widget doesn't matter. That's not what's going to affect any of the settings. Um, it's just so you can see what's happening. Uh, so we've got this camera. And if we just choose camera, this is what we get. If we choose camera and aim, it's going to add a second point to this, uh, which is in my outliner right now. There it is, right here. Okay, and so the aim is the camera is going to point at wherever you move that. Okay, which can be helpful. I find it more helpful for animation purposes than I do for still renders. Um, but you do have that option. And then the third option that you have here with the group is, oops, I thought it was the group, oh, camera shape, uh, is camera aim and up, which will give you an additional control, oops, which kind of got a preview of what it does there. Uh, the up control, oh, let me select this in the group, and that's not, okay, there we go, um, will... The, t the top of the camera, the camera will roll to kind of point towards that. So if you wanted to do any kind of inception-y style camera moves, um, that can be useful for, for those purposes. But again, for this project, uh, and we're just doing still renders, just a camera is fine. I'll scale that up. And the way that I like to work with the camera is actually through the view. So I'm going to go to panels, perspective, and choose my camera. Now, for me, it's camera two because I already have a camera in the scene. For you, it's probably going to be camera one. I'm going to choose camera two. And now, as I move my camera around like I would, you know, just normally moving the viewport around, um, the camera will follow. So, uh, you know, alt left click will orbit, alt middle click will pan. Alt right click will zoom, um, but we can't exactly see where the edges of the frame are, so we need to get that set up. Uh, in the viewport, you've got this button right here, underneath the show menu, and it, the button uh, says film gate. Click on that, and you can see the bounds of your actual frame. Uh, you can also access that uh, if you go to uh, your attribute editor and camera shape. And you go to the, I gotta remember what section it's in. It's on object display, it is display options, display film gate. All right, it does the exact same thing. Uh, once you do that, you also are probably gonna wanna set some overscan so you can actually see the bounds. So we'll set the overscan to 1.2. Okay, and now you can see the edges of the frame. It's a slightly more roundabout way to do it, but it's another way to do it if you. Uh, like that option. So um, I said I want the, the renders to be 1920 by 1080. Okay, that's a standard widescreen format. Uh, it's TV broadcast widescreen. 
Uh, so we need to set that up. And if we scroll back up to the top of the camera attributes under uh, film back section, I want to set the film gate to 1.85, 35 millimeter, 1.85 projection. All right. And then uh, also, I, I, let me adjust that over scan a little bit more. Let's go 1.3. Okay, so we can see the edges of that. So now we have the frame of our image. We can also adjust in the display options the gate mask color, right? If you want something to, to make it a little bit more obvious where your bounds are, you can even adjust the opacity to really focus in on exactly what the camera is going to see and nothing else. So we've got the the aspect ratio um, set up. We've got we can see the edges of our frame. Another important choice for cameras is to choose your lens. What is your focal length? Um, oftentimes for real estate uh, photography, you're going to go with a wider lens because it makes the space feel larger. So something 35 is is kind of the standard starting point. It's kind of a mid length. It's a wider mid um, lens. What if we go to like 24? You can see you can see more of the frame. Uh, and if you go, I probably wouldn't go wider than 20. Because if you get to like 15, you're not going to start getting some distortion at the edges of the frame. It's going to start feeling more fisheye-like. Um, so I think I'm going to keep it at 24 for this. Um, we can, we've got a near clip plane and a far clip plane, and this is basically the depth that the camera sees. Uh, so if I get too close to this table, at some point it's going to disappear. There it goes. All right. And so that's a function of the clip plane. If I move this further away, let's say if I set that to like five and I get closer, you can see now it's, it's clipping that that table leg as I get closer to it. That's what the clip plane is doing. Um, it's not something I, that I often mess with, but sometimes if you can't see the, the things that are really far away in your scene, then I'll extend the far clip plane, but 10,000 should be enough for your scenes. If it's not, just bump that up at a zero at the end and it'll be fine. Um, so we got aspect ratio. We don't need to worry about squeeze. Um, the next thing to actually, before we get to depth of field, because we're actually not going to use the depth of field section, we're going to use the Arnold section for depth of field controls. Uh, but before we, we do that is we need to put our camera in place. We need to set what it's actually going to see. So, uh, for a wide shot, now granted my room is slightly sparse at the moment, but let's say for a wide shot, we'll go something like this. All right, we'll go maybe a little bit higher. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, the next thing I want to do is I want to make sure my camera stays there. Because if I forget to change out of the camera view and I start orbiting my, my view to see something else, then I've moved the camera and now I need to get back to where I was. So. You could keyframe the position and the rotation of the camera, um, but then if you forget to change your frame if you're moving the camera, that can, again, you you can get yourself in trouble pretty easily. So what I'm going to use is uh, our bookmarks. So if I go to View and Bookmarks, okay, this is in the this is in the top view menu. This is uh, actually there isn't a top view menu, uh, but it's in the viewport View and Bookmarks and Edit Bookmarks. And this is, it's basically remembering your camera's attributes. So I'm going to click new bookmark and I'm going to call it um, wide shot. Okay. And I'm going to hit return. And now I've created that bookmark. And then maybe I can go over here and maybe I'm, I'm interested in a shot like this. Okay. Then I'm going to add a new bookmark and I'm going to call it uh, stools underscore close. All right. Now, if I want to get back to my wide shot, I select wide shot and click apply and I'm back to the wide shot. If I want to go back to the stools, I click stools and apply and I'm back to the stools. 
Okay, so I've, I've remembered that and I can I can move my camera however I want. And then if I just I can go back to either one just like that and it's not going to be affected. Um, so I think it, it gives you the kind of the cleanest control over camera positioning and remembering those spots. You could also just add four cameras to your scene. That's another option. Um, it's really however works best for you. Um, I like the bookmark. I think it's a, it's a really kind of a slick and clean way to do it. Uh, what I'm not sure actually, because I haven't tested, is if it will remember focal lengths. So let's say we want to go with a more, a longer focal length. Let's say we go to 85. And I adjust this. I just want to kind of look down the, the row here. Add a new bookmark and we'll say, we'll call this one countertop. Return. Let's go back to the a different angle and back to countertop it looks like yeah it remembers the focal length so that is great um, so there's our, our different um, camera angles and uh, okay so now I'm ready to, to look at the depth of field and I'll use this shot for my depth of field. So, like I said, I'm not going to use the um, depth of field section for the camera. I'm going to go down to the Arnold section in the uh, camera shape node. And this is where I'm going to do all my depth of field settings. So the first thing I need to do is enable it. So it's a little checkbox, uh, a few lines down, click enable depth of field and nothing is going to happen immediately but that's fine there's just a few adjustments that we need to make um, first is the focus distance and that is how far away is the camera focusing so are you focusing on something that is five feet in front of you or are you focusing on something that is 20 feet in front of you that's going to affect what is and is not in focus all right it's just like a real camera uh, to determine that you could set up the measure tool and you can go to uh, create measure tool and set up the distance tool. Uh, but there's a faster way. And that is if you turn on the heads up display, object details. Right? Display, heads up display, object details. You turn that on and one of the options that you have there is distance from camera. Which is a very fast way. So whatever you have selected, it's going to tell you how far away from the camera it is. If you want to focus on the couch, that is 784.863 units. I'm just going to round that to 785. Uh, if I want to focus on the stool, that is 200 and we'll round it to 3 units away. All right, so now we can select that camera again. Uh, and I'll select it in the outliner. And now we can set our focus distance. I'll, I'll set it to the stool, which is 203. All right, and we're still not going to see any focus, uh, any depth of field yet. You know, I'll bring up the render so you can see it. And we want to render camera shape two. Okay, so here's my render view. Um, but we're not going to see any uh, any depth of field because our aperture size is set to zero. So that's the size of the opening of the camera. It's like an f-stop, but the numbers will not behave the way an f-stop does. Um, aperture size refers to the actual physical diameter of the opening of the camera. So the larger numbers is going to give you a more shallow depth of field, um, just like a, a regular camera, but it's not going to, you know, it doesn't go by f 2.8456811.22 um, and on up. Uh, you can just kind of type in whatever you want. So. We'll start with uh, five. We'll see what that looks like. Okay, so five is a pretty extreme uh, example here, where we could, the the stool is in focus, at least mostly in focus. You know, the the back leg is going to be a little bit blurry. Uh, the couch is way out of focus because this is a very large relative opening. Uh, if I set the aperture size to one. Okay, now we can see the stool obviously is still in focus because I haven't changed the focus distance. The couch is, is a little bit more in focus. This is a little bit probably more of a reasonable depth of field. Uh, so I'm going to let this render for a second. I'll save the snapshot and then I'll render out um, the, uh, 
the one with no depth of field, and we can kind of compare them. Okay, so that finished rendering, 8 minutes 44 seconds. I'm going to grab that snapshot. I'll also save it out. I'll do file save image, and I'll call it um, stool depth of field color. Um, and we will save that in our images and click Save. And there it is. Uh, now I'm going to render it without depth of field. So I'm just going to uncheck Enable Depth of Field. And we're going to let that go. And this is going to go uh, considerably faster. It'll still probably take a minute or so. But um, it'll definitely be faster than the 8 minutes and 44 seconds of uh, the depth of field version. OK, so it finished rendering. Uh, and this time it took 8.47, which is longer than I expected it to. But um, I don't know. I'm not sure exactly why that is. It might have been because I was messing around with the computer during it. Uh, but you can see the difference here between no depth of field and with depth of field. And uh, it's definitely a much more interesting scene with depth of field. It really, you know, without it, your, your eye kind of looks at the stool, it wanders over to the couch. And then we look at this poorly framed um, poster, which is just dipping into, into, uh, into the shot. With depth of field, your eye knows exactly where to go. Um, and it kind of holds your interests, interest a little bit. So that's setting up depth of field um, and hitting render. You know, once you get that render, you just have to go to File, Save Image. Uh, we're not really going to worry about doing any multi-layer EXRs um, or anything. Just 8-bit is fine. But now what I want to talk about, now that we have, you know, you know how to set up your camera, um, put it in place, hit render. Now I want to talk about uh, adding some ambient occlusion. And ambient occlusion is... Basically, it's, it's a way in 3D to create the effect of contact shadows. Uh, so let me find a, an example here real quick. Okay, so the idea of uh, contact shadows or ambient inclusion is that when you have two objects close to each other, it's going to naturally create a little bit of a shadow. So if you look like where this plate is hitting uh, the napkin, we've got this really dark shadow, even though the scene is, is well illuminated. Um, same thing on the underside of the napkin and the table. I've uh, got those contact shadows. You, know, you can also see it here at the, you know, where the grapes are on the ground. And it's, you know, naturally, it just happens as a factor of the lighting and how the shadows fall. But in 3D, you don't always get that same richness of contact shadows. And that's where something like ambient occlusion comes into play. Uh, and the way that we're going to render that is Arnold has an ambient occlusion shader. But instead of having to just assign that shader to everything in your scene and, and you know undoing all of your shader designations, which if you have a more complicated scene, you don't want to do. Um, we're going to do it through um, a render setup. So I've got my scene, and there's a last render button that we've never really talked about, and that's the render setup window. All right, it's the one just to the right of the hypershade. I'm going to click on that, and it's going to open up this render setup. I've actually already got this whole thing set up, but I'm going to ignore that for now, and we're just going to do this from scratch. So what you want to do is you want to create a new layer in this render setup, and that's with this um, the square with the plus icon. Click, up, click on that and name it. So in this case, it's going to be um, occlusion. Sorry, I can't type and talk at the same time. And I'll call it occlusion 2 because I've already got one. All right, once you have that, need to create a new collection. And uh, in this collection, we need to add everything in our scene. So the easiest way to do that is in the outliner, select absolutely everything in the scene uh, that is a mesh. So we don't want to, we don't want to select the lights. So let me just grab those and go down to here. And then middle click and drag to include it in the selection. So I also need to make sure I grab the stool here. And I need to grab this room block, grab that in there. OK, so I've got everything that's in my scene is now in this collection. Um, and that's just telling it that whatever we're doing with this layer, all of these objects are going to be affected. Once we have that, and I'm going to right click on um, the collection, and I want to create a shader override. All right, and this is going to say, instead of whatever shader the objects are assigned, use this shader instead. So I'm going to create my shader override. I'm going to override shader. 
click on the uh, on the little checkerboard icon, and I'm going to navigate to Arnold Shader Ambient Occlusion. All right, so it's going to add that ambient occlusion shader. And now I just have to turn this layer on. If I do that, it's going to take a second to think about it. There it goes. All right, so now everything in the scene is turned white. Um, which, by the way, if you don't see something in the scene that should be, so like if I go down here, select my room block, and hit remove, now in my scene I don't have a back wall. All right, that tells me that that's not included in this group. When I have the group, when I have the visibility set, like when I have it turned on and something is missing, it means it's not in the group. So I need to make sure I add that into my scene. Okay. So once I have that turned on, I just hit render like normal. Okay, and it's going to render everything with that ambient occlusion uh, shader. So let me close that out and re-hit render. It's going to think about it for a second. And there we go. So now it's rendering. So this is what ambient inclusion is. is it it kind of looks like a just as one big light, um, but it's really just processing the contact shadows. So as two objects get closer together, you're going to get deeper shadows. So right here at the at the bottom where the wheel meets the floor, you're going to get shadows, um, you know, on the underside of these cabinets, around the rim of the stool. Um, but where there's nothing, no, you know, there aren't two objects close together. You're not going to get any shadows. Um, you know, inside of the couch cushions, we get those shadows. And this is something that you can actually adjust. You're not just stuck with the default settings. So I'll just leave this open on the side here, and I'll turn on a, a render preview here. There we go. So let's just focus on this area. Um, if I go back to my render setup window and my shader override, if you click on this um, input button, it'll take your, your attribute editor to the options. And so you can adjust the number of samples that it's using. So if you're finding that your shadows are really noisy, you can up those samples. Um, you can adjust the spread, which I probably wouldn't recommend. Uh, you can see it gets really funky with the as you adjust the spread so I wouldn't really recommend that I want to adjust this a little bit um, but the fall off will have a rather significant effect obviously if you go too far it just turns white so uh, let's try like 0.5 yeah this scene might not let's try 0.1 0 0.0 one. Okay, so you can see that's zero, and then 0 0.01 really lightens it up. So if it's if you're finding it spreading too far, then maybe you can you can adjust the fall off a little bit. Uh, I'm actually going to keep it at zero. I'm okay with that. Um, afterwards, when we composite this in Photoshop, we'll have more control over the intensity and the effect of this. Um, but this is where you can you can adjust those. Again, that's if you go to the render setup click on the shader override, and you click on this um, input button right there. In your attribute editor, those options will pop up. You can also get there if you just open up your hypershade. Right, and you can go to your um, ambient occlusion, which in my case is this node, and then you can make those adjustments in the hypershade, right, because it is just a shader. So once you do that, uh, I will turn off my render view. We're just going to let this render out, um, then I'm going to save it out, and I'll show you how to composite that uh, in Photoshop. It's done. It only took 20 seconds, um, much faster than the, the full-color textured render, which is kind of to be expected because it is just one simple shader. Um, so I'm going to hit File and Save, and I'm going to call this one Stool. Oh, I didn't turn Depth of Field back on, so let me cancel that. Whoops, I do still want Depth of Field because that's going to be in my final render. So let me select my camera, which is camera two, and go to my shape and turn on depth of field. Okay, and now we're gonna let that render. Um, and the last one only took 20 seconds, so this one should take 
roughly 20 seconds, I'm guessing. Maybe a little bit longer because I'm still actively recording while this goes, but uh, pretty quick nonetheless. Uh, and while that's happening, I'll actually I'll open up Photoshop in the background just to further slow down the render. Okay, we'll need Photoshop here in a second. All right, there it goes, 21 seconds. Uh, it's a little bit noisy back there, so you may want to up the samples a little bit, but um, it'll be all right for our purposes here. So file, save, image. I'm going to call this stool depth of field AO for ambient occlusion. Okay, so that one's saved. Uh, and while I'm here, I'm just going to quickly set up a wireframe render. It's going to work the same way that occlusion does. So I'm going to... Uh, actually, can I just duplicate this? No, apparently not. Okay. So I'm going to we'll turn off. Oh. Okay, I hit all the things. There we go. Uh, so new uh, new layer, and we'll call this wireframe. Okay, I'm going to right-click on that and create a collection. And then I need to add everything to the collection. So again, that is select everything in the outliner. And then middle, whoop, and Maya quit. So please stand by. Recently, um, which means we're not going to get the exact same angle, but uh, I will show you how to set up a, a wireframe. Anyway, uh, so I'm going to, actually, I'll do it this way because I've got a scene that we can use here. And also, don't save. Oh, actually, it is this exact scene, so never mind. Um, all right, we'll just go with it. So we're going to set it up the same way. So we open up our render setup window, again, by just clicking up here. And we're going to add a layer, and we'll call this wireframe. And then I'm going to right-click, create a collection. In the outliner, I'm going to select everything. Middle-click and drag and add it. Again, make sure you get everything. So I've got a couple of miscellaneous objects at the top and the bottom here that need to go over. Okay. Uh, right click on the collection and create a shader override. And then in the override shader, click on the uh, checker box, Arnold shader and wireframe. Turn it on. And then we'll hit render. Again, you can see the options that we have here, um, but here's just the default. We'll make sure that we, oh, we're actually rendering this camera, okay. So, render, and it is not rendering very many samples at all. So let's check our render settings. That's fine. There it goes. Okay, so this is what a wireframe render looks like. Now, uh, I don't want to see all the triangles and also, oh no, that never mind, that's fine. Um, so I'm going to, in the attribute editor, I'm going to set the edge type from triangles to polygons. Okay, that'll clean it up a little bit. And then you can adjust the fill color and line color. I'm perfectly fine keeping it just black and white. Um, the idea is to show off the actual construction of your models, um, which, you know, in this scene is not terribly exciting. It's just a lot of boxes. But, um, you know, as you have more intricate models, um, this, is kind of, this is a very valuable way to show off your skills as a modeler because you can get away with a lot and hide a lot if you're good at texturing and lighting. But, you know, you, if your wireframes are good, you want to show them off because that, that matters, especially for if you're talking about games where you really need to optimize and, and you know have a judicious use of um, geometry. You know, wireframe is a great way to show that off. So you can adjust line width. Uh, you can see if you know these are looking a little bit, well, they're looking black because there's so many edges close together. So you can turn that line width down um, or up, kind of depending on the scale of your scene and the density of your edges. But once you have that and it, and it renders, which it doesn't take long at all to render, um, Okay, seven seconds, then you just file and save the image like you would anything else.
So once you have those three things rendered, um, the, the wireframe you can just turn in as its own wireframe. Um, but the ambient occlusion we want to apply to the um, to the color render. So I've got my stool uh, depth of field color file. I'm going to open that up. And then I want to, I'm just going to drag my, um, just so you can see it, my ambient inclusion on top of that. And I'm just going to hit return so it's perfectly centered, same size. Uh, and I'm going to set the blending mode to, uh, actually not overlay, we want to go multiply. Okay. So blending modes and multiply, and it looks very similar. It doesn't really look like anything happened, but if you toggle it on and off, you can see that it does, in fact, it deepens the shadows. It gives a little bit more detail. You, you can see the detail in the uh, in the floorboards a little bit better. Uh, and if you decide that, oh, maybe this isn't quite enough, or maybe I just want more detail in the floorboards, I can duplicate, uh, duplicate the layer, and I, it'll ex accentuate that area even more. Uh, and then at this point, if it looks good to you, Save it out as a, as a JPEG and call it good. Uh, but there's more you can do in Photoshop, right? Photoshop is a super powerful program, and you can use that to really fully finish your scene. So, you know, maybe with, with the second layer of ambient occlusion, I like the extra detail it gives me in the floorboards, but it's making the side here too dark. Then I can add a layer mask and make sure that I have a soft uh, brush here. And I'll increase the size, all right? And I can kind of remove her from that side and maybe get rid of it under the couch and really only focus on that extra ambient occlusion where I want it, which is, that didn't really do much because my opacity seems to be really low. Oh, I would think I was also just in the wrong thing. All right, so soft round brush. There we go. I'm going to... There we go. Now we're really seeing it. Okay. So we're keeping those areas a little bit lighter, but I want to add some more darkness in this area. So we toggle off our, our second layer, and you can see we're getting extra detail in the floorboards, but the rest of the scene is, is more or less unaffected. Um, so you can do that and really kind of dial in your shadows the way that you want them. You can uh, give the whole scene a vignette, which looks nice sometimes, oftentimes. So I'm just going to add a solid solid color, black, and then I'm going to add a marquee selection, elliptical marquee. I'm going to set my feather to, uh, let's go, I'll go 300 pixels. And I'm just going to drag from one corner to the other. and uh, set it to, let me delete that layer mask, and just mask the layer. Okay, and you can see it's a bit, ex actually I need to invert the layer mask. There we go. Now, that's a very extreme vignette and more than I would want to go, so I'm going to dial that opacity way back. But what it does is it just, it darkens the corners a little bit, it draws your eye into the scene. So you can do a general um, vignette like that, uh, or you could be a little bit more targeted with it. So I, maybe if I delete that layer mask, or just delete layer in general. Oops. Um, again, I'm just going to add that. And then I'll take my brush, big soft brush. And if I just want to focus on the stool, and then I can dial that opacity way back. Again, it just gives me a very subtle way to draw the eye in to where I want it. Um, subtlety is key here with vignettes. You know, I, I, whenever I use a vignette, I use it all the time on just about anything that I edit or color correct. Um, if you think back to Ansel Adams, the great landscape photographer, he did a, what he called a 10% burn on the corners. And what that means is he darkened the corners very slightly. Um, and it was something that you couldn't necessarily notice, but it's a subconscious way to just draw your eye into the frame. And so that's that's what a vignette does when it's when it's working well. Um, but you can do more than that too. If you want to uh, adjust your colors, you can add an adjustment layer, right? 
you can do any of the, any of the um, kind of normal adjustments, modifications in Photoshop that you want. If I wanted to add a maybe a gradient overlay, uh, let's see if we have any interesting presets. Okay, that's that's garish at first, but if we set that to overlay and we turn that opacity way down, okay, you can do that. You can maybe add some uh, some grain back in. You just need to duplicate the background layer. It's always good to work in a non-destructive way whenever possible. Um, let's add some. You can add a lens flare. Don't well, don't use a lens flare. It's just so overused. Um, let's see, where is the noise and grain in Photoshop? I never remember. Under the noise menu. Yes, that would make sense. Uh, so let's add some noise. And you know, that's that's terrible and ugly. So I'm going to go monochromatic. And again, subtlety is king here. Or queen. Whatever you prefer. Um, uh, let's see, what does three look like? I'm going to go uniform. Eh. We'll say two. All right, so you add a little bit of grain. Now, grain is different than render artifacts that you just didn't hit, hit enough samples, right? Um, and if anything, you know, I'm not sure exactly how much this is contributing, but just want to show a few different options that you can do. You know, if, if you have, um, sometimes when you're rendering, you'll have like one pixel that is just bright white and it, everything else around it is really dark. It's called a firefly. Um, so if you need to use your clone stamp tool or your he healing brush, you know, you can certainly do that. Let's say that, like, oh, I didn't actually want that to be bright orange. You can just heal that away. You know, minor corrections like that. The idea is to get the best-looking finished image that you that you can. And obviously you want to do as much of that in Maya as, as possible, but, you know, Photoshop is, is good for some things. Um, maybe you have a cup of coffee sitting on the desk and you want to add some steam after after the fact, then you can find a nice alpha layer picture of steam and just uh, plop it in, that's fine. Um, the idea is to get, you know, interesting, compelling uh, images out of it.